Can you explain this slide to everybody, Mark? Uh, sure. So uh, most directors, as you all know, receive overwhelming majorities uh, in favor of their reelection. Uh, but the percentage of directors who receive who are receiving significant opposition, which we're defining as 20% or more, right, uh, they fall below the 80% threshold. Uh, that number is uh, is up fairly significantly uh, to the highest level since the financial crisis. And and why is that? And so, uh, unfortunately, yeah, it, it's a little hard to read. But uh, there are four main reasons why the opposition rates have increased. Uh, one is uh, Overboarding standards. Uh, many large investors have tightened up their limits for the number of boards on which it's appropriate for an individual director to sit. Uh, another issue is board diversity, and uh, companies that still have all male boards are seeing increased opposition primarily to the nominating committee chair, in some cases to the full nominating committee. Uh, as I noted earlier, uh, responsiveness, in particular in cases where a shareholder proposal has gotten majority support or a say on pay proposal has failed, uh, the legally speaking, these are non-binding proposals and the board can ignore the result, but in practice, it's not a good idea to do that. Well, let's break the, I'm sorry. And, and the fourth reason is, is we use the overall term accountability, but it's issues such as the ones we were discussing IPOs with poor governance, and by the way, that includes dual class capital structures with no sunset provision. So let's talk about overboarding first. Just so everybody's clear on this, what do you mean by overboarding? So we define overboarding as sitting on more than five boards, or in the case of a sitting public company CEO, more than three boards in total. Uh, the, the five board limit was lowered a few years ago from six. Uh, and we've kept it there for the time being. Many large investors, however, have adopted a four board limit uh, and a two board limit for sitting CEOs and in some cases other full-time executives as well. So, so when you have an overboarding situation, yeah. do you recommend against the entire board or just the overboarded the, direct? The overboarded individual, but uh, if that individual fails to win majority support, uh, and remains on the board, then we may escalate. But in, in general, this is, this is targeted, these recommendations are targeted at the overboarded individual. Uh, uh, on on your slide, Mark, there's a reference to three is the new four for overboarded CEOs. Can you yes. explain that? Uh, so it used to be that four boards or more would garner an, against recommendation from a lot of large investors. For CEO. For CEO, yes. And now uh, sitting on three boards, meaning the company where you're CEO and two outside boards. That is true. Although ISS policy still considers that to be acceptable, many investors don't anymore. Essentially, the reason is that the job of a public company director has gotten more demanding, more time consuming, uh, as evidenced by studies done by the NACD, for example, and as evidenced by all of the things that we've talked about so far today. Kind of a theme today, yeah increased demands for engagement with shareholders, and by the way, regulators as well, uh, and on and on and on. You mentioned diversity. Yes. So, so what's happening generally with respect to diversity in America's boardrooms? So uh, we've reached a milestone. There are no more all-male boards in the S&P 500. Uh, that was. <laughs> who was. Who was the last holdout? <laughs> well, the, the last holdout was was actually a company that was added just recently to the index. It was Copart, uh, automotive auctions. Uh, and it's not that they were in the index for many years and held out. They, they recently got promoted to the S&P 500 and realized, oh, well, we're out of step. And, and they did add a woman to the board. But they were the last ones. Uh, outside the S&P 500, if you go down to the Russell 3000, it's uh, more like 10%-ish of companies still have all male boards, maybe maybe a little more. Uh, the, those numbers are declining, however. Uh, by the time we get to 2020 annual meetings, uh, there will be fewer uh, companies that still have all male boards. And part of that is due to investor pressure. Part of it is due to things like the California law mandating uh, women on the board of California companies, even if they're incorporated in Delaware, which, by the way, I expected to be challenged. It was somewhat belatedly challenged in court, but uh, uh, 
we'll see what, what the result is. Uh, but I, I think those companies, there, there's a hardcore of companies that refuse to bow to pressure and they say we'll do it when we're damn good and ready and not a minute sooner and uh, and they're going to face the wrath of State Street and, and uh, other large investors for, for doing that. Uh, maybe they don't care or maybe they relish the fight, I don't know. Do you have a typical recommendation for or against social and environmental pr types of proposals? Uh, it really depends a lot on the subject matter uh, and on what's being asked and, and how the company uh, is performing on that issue relative to a relevant peer group. So for example, uh, if the proposal seeks more disclosure of political contributions or lobbying expenditures, we look at what the company is disclosing now, not just about the amounts donated, but um, about the process. How is, it, is there a committee of the board that's responsible for overseeing this, for example? Uh, uh, and so we look at whether there have been significant controversies related to the company's political contributions or lobbying expenditures, uh, uh, factors such as those. Okay. Uh, trends in ENS, can you talk about those please? Sure, so somewhat surprisingly this year, no environmental proposals got majority support. Uh, about a dozen social issue proposals did and some of those have an environmental dimension. For example, if a public utility uh, is getting a shareholder proposal on lobbying, it means that shareholders are concerned about lobbying on climate issues for the most part, rather than any other issue that the company might be lobbying on. But uh, nonetheless, it was somewhat surprising that there were no environmental proposals that got majority support after uh, a period, a couple of years, in which uh, seven or eight got majority support. Mostly uh, two degree scenario proposals. Do I have to, should I explain what a two degree scenario proposal please, please is? Do. So uh, they're seeking disclosure of, of how, how the company's uh, business model might be impacted by regulations designed to limit global warming to no more than two degrees over pre-industrial levels. Uh, we saw proposals like that at Exxon, Occidental, a number of other companies get majority support uh, in 2017 and 18, but 2019 there were none. Now, if you've already submitted a proposal and the company produced a report, perhaps you don't need to do it again. They're not gonna necessarily produce much new, and so some of the proponents change their focus to other topics. Uh, or they may have uh, increased the demand, all right, we've got a report, now we want to see something more concrete, like targets, concrete targets for reducing greenhouse gases. Uh, those are much more likely to get challenged uh, and to survive a challenge. I mean, sorry, sorry, to not survive a challenge. Uh, in other words, the SEC is likely to side with the company and say this is uh, uh, not an appropriate pr proposal topic. Uh, can you comment on the SEC's proposal of the threshold for shareholder proposals? They want to raise that. And also, if there's a shareholder vote that fails of the time period for resubmission. We know that this was high on the, the wish list of, of folks in the business community who, who uh, wanted to raise the resubmission thresholds, even more than the ownership thresholds for initially submitting a proposal. It's the resubmission thresholds, what percentage support a proposal has to get in order to be eligible to be resubmitted. Uh, this, this was a priority, and this is, uh, in fact, apparently coming to pass. Uh, I would say that there aren't that many proposals that hang around year after year at the same company getting single digit levels of support. Uh, I would say that where a proposal is getting 20 or 25 percent support consistently, that's not trivial. That indicates that a, a significant percentage of the shareholder base thinks there's an issue here, thinks there's a concern. Why would a company want to deny itself the information value of that? vote. Uh, it's not like companies are having to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to each year to make the same arguments against the proposal that they made the past year. Uh, any, any arguments that companies make about the cost of responding to a shareholder proposal we think are a bit, tend to be a bit inflated because they include, include things that companies don't necessarily have to do uh, or they're uh, they're assuming uh, time value of their uh, internal 
council that's maybe a little inflated. <laughs>